Okay, so we're continuing our discussion of the discipline of engaging the church in the Christian life. And now we get to talk about church membership. So here are our goals for this class period. I want you to explain the practice of church commitment or church membership. I want you to be able to explain that, say what this is, and know some key texts about commitment to the local church. Okay? Pretty straightforward. We've got to do this fairly quickly because this class period isn't very long, this, uh, this midday one. I want to start with a quotation uh, from your textbook, Habits of Grace. And one of the things he says is this, One thing to make explicit here at the end of this first chapter on fellowship and the beginning of part three on the means of grace in the church is that the deepest, most durable form of fellowship is covenantal. In other words, it's between parties that made a formal commitment to each other. This is not only true in the partnership of marriage, but also in the local church. When we make vows or promises to each other in covenanting together in a local church as members or partners or whatever term a church uses, we don't inhibit the true life of the church, but give the truest conditions for its growth and flourishing. When our fellowship is not simply a network of loose Christian relationships, but anchored in a particular covenantal community as committed members together in a local outpost of Christ's kingdom, we come closest to experiencing what those first Christians did. When people just didn't drift in and out of the community, but were either in or out. And those who were in were pledged to be in the church for each other through thick and thin. Covenant community is like Christian marriage, and that is within the framework of stated commitments and promised allegiances that life and relationship is guarded, nourished, and encouraged most to thrive. It comes up pretty strong that you should be committed to a local church, and in his view, that expression of that is membership. Now, in the American church context, uh, we have terms like church shopping. What does church shopping mean? It means like, oh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to shop around for the one that I like the most. Now, there's a sense in which church shopping might not be the most egregious of terms. You move to a new place. When you move to Cedarville, for example, as a freshman, you might have what you call church shopping. It's where you're trying to find a church um, where you can commit and you can thrive there's a biblical church and there's areas for you to minister. If you mean by that church shopping, well, I don't want to criticize that. But some people church shop like window shopping and they float around to various churches, never settling down and taking roots and making a commitment to a particular congregation. One of the things that Mathis does here is he compares this idea of church covenant to some ways like the covenant of marriage. Now, it's not a perfect comparison, but there's some, some help here. So I've mentioned that most of your churches have a church covenant. Does anybody, like, does anybody know, like, oh, my church does have a church covenant? Okay, some of you are like, it may or may not, uh, but I bet if you, uh, you went on the website or you asked one of your pastoral team members, they would probably say, yes, it does have a church covenant. It has a a stated uh, group of commitments that we have made. So I have a question for you, and I want to uh, interact with you. I'm not going to have the, you break up in your groups, but I want you to entertain this. What would you say to a young man who's dated a girl for years, but refuses to commit to marriage because I don't need to sign on a dotted line for my love and commitment to be real? Now, you're like, does this actually happen? It happens all the time. In fact, the erosion of commitment in general in the states has led to the erosion of commitment both in church and in marriage. So, a young man says that, like, look, I don't need to sign on the dotted line for my commitment to her to be real. In fact, it's, it's actually more genuine because when I wake up in the morning, I still love her and that's what binds us together. It's not some document that I signed years ago. There's a genuineness and authenticity to our love, and there's a genuineness to this relationship 
not because of some you know, external commitment that we made, but because we love one another. What do you say to this person? How many uh, young ladies would be happy to date a young man like that for a decade? Um, uh, no. Young men, don't be like that also. Um, no, ladies, you found this very unsatisfying. What was so unsatisfying about it? Yeah. He probably doesn't actually love you if he's not willing to commit. <laughs> That's right. yeah. it's, he's mistaking the nature of love, right? Uh, does this end well? No. <laughs> it will end, uh, but it will not end well. It will end in disaster and broken hearts. So his view is this, that like the formalization destroys authenticity. So if I'm going to formalize this, it's going to destroy the authenticity. And the relationship's actually truer, in a sense, purer, if I can leave at any moment unfettered. The reality is, is that the rejection of commitment is the rejection of authenticity. Love is commitment. So to reject commitment is to reject love. You see, he has inverted things. In his view of things here, the relationship sustains the commitment. So long as the relationship is good, there's a commitment. But in reality, commitment is that fertile soil in which the relationship can flourish. It provides the stability or the foundation on which you build a relationship. Commitment sustains the relationship, not the other way around. The person who doesn't want to ruin the genuineness of their love by getting married has only the visage of genuine love because love is commitment. Now, why do I bring up that picture of marriage? Well, it's obviously to talk about church membership. So somebody might say a very similar thing of the church. I don't need to sign on the dotted line to say that I'm committed to this church. Many people reject church membership because signing on the dotted line doesn't make me any more or less committed to this church. And my response to that is, actually, yes, it does. It actually does. Your willingness to say, I am committed and sign your name is a statement of commitment that makes you more committed. And as a side note, if you're at a church where your leaders are telling you that they want you to formally commit, and you say, no, I will not commit, are you in submission to your leaders? Now, that's an, another question. Are, are you willing to make that sort of a commitment? Similarly, like the work of marriage begins with a commitment and a wedding, so the work of church membership begins with the formalization of that relationship as well. Okay, so what does it look like to commit to a local church? Now, just to put my cards on the table, I'm going to argue uh, the expression of commitment to local church in the American context should be formal church membership. That might take a little different form if uh, you have an underground church in some persecuted area. You know that you have your, your commitments are understood and they're stated maybe in different ways. I think this is the way that we can live this out in our current context. I want to engage you in the discussion. I realize that some of you might, this might be a foreign concept for you. Some of you might be like, yeah, I'm at churches that we practice church membership. This is what we're, the expectation is, is what I want to do. Some of you are like, I've never heard that term before. I want to engage you in this conversation to help you think about what it might look like to commit to a local church. Okay, I've got a, I don't have many funny memes, but I love this one. Now, what, what would happen here? Like, I mean, like, I'm part of the universal gym, but you have to work out in a local gym, right? It takes a local gym for you to actualize your workout goals. It's he's hinting at the idea here of the universal versus the local church, because some people will tell me, well, I'm part of the universal church. I don't need to be a part of a local church. No. Uh, being a part of the universal church, that next movement then is to commit to a local church. I have a book that I found helpful 
by Jonathan Lehman. He says this, A person is included in the universal church through salvation. Yet at this point, the church remains an abstract idea without a palpable and public presence. A second constitutive movement is needed in order for the church to show up on planet earth. For that to happen, a group of Christians must gather and organize themselves or be organized as a congregation and affirm one another as believers. Think about that. Being written in the Lamb's book of life, the natural outflow of that is that you would be written on the rolls of a local church. Now even as I say that, I know that some people like bristle against that. That's stating it pretty starkly, but, but I think it's, it's true. So, here's a question that I ask. Would it be an appropriate or inappropriate assignment for this class to make you join a local church? So imagine you come in as a freshman, it's fall semester, I'm teaching you Bible and the Gospel, and... You know, 10% of your grade is at the end. Which church did you join? Is that legitimate? I got a yes. Anybody think it's, why is it not legitimate? Yeah. Yeah, I force you to memorize scripture. Is that, is that not legitimate? Maybe <laughs> maybe that's illegitimate too. Yeah. Um, because if it's in this area, you're pretty much saying, "Oh yeah, I'm just committing for the four years while I'm at college." Yeah, and I want you to commit for the four years while you're at college. I want you. I mean, I don't know where I'm going to be in four years, um, so I want you to settle roots quickly. Yeah. Um, anybody else think it's legitimate, illegitimate? Yeah. I think that it is legitimate because even though it's enforced, I don't think it's forced because it should be natural. Should be natural. Like, it should be what you're going to do. Yeah. So, um, this gets to the heart of, is this, a, uh, is this an exercise in spiritual formation? I want to say, yes, it is. And I think it would be, um, I think it would be valuable for students, like, I can imagine, like if I could have a wish for every incoming freshman, it's that they would join a local church their first semester. Think about that. Can you make that your goal? Like you come here, you don't have a church home. I realize you're going to look on the internet, you see what local churches are there. It might take you a few weeks to visit a few targeted ones, but stop looking for the perfect one. That, that, you're not going to find that one, right? You're not going to find the perfect church. And I'm going to tell you, I love my church. My church is messed up. we got a lot of problems, right? Every church is like that. Find a good church, a faithful church, where you can be fed and you can feed others, where you can serve and settle down there. Um, here's what church commitment is. It's a formal commitment to live the Christian life with a particular group of believers. It's a commitment to be overseen by godly leaders and a commitment to pursue discipleship and mission together. Okay, it's a formal commitment to live the Christian life with a particular group of believers or or covenanting together. It's a commitment to be overseen by leaders and to pursue discipleship and mission together. Now, what are some things that make this idea hard? Well, the first thing is, we just have an impulse to deny interdependence. We want to say, I am sufficient on my own. We want to deny that we need one another. Now, just... Think real quickly about 1 Corinthians 12. The eye cannot say to the hand, I have no need of you. But that's kind of what we want to do, right? 
We don't want to say, I need you. There's a desire towards autonomy, self-governance, and self-direction. I want to be overseen by leaders. Does that mean I have to submit to a leader? Well, the Bible says, yes, <laughs> submit to your leaders. And if there's a rejection of the idea of formal commitment, I want to say, well, what leaders are you submitting to? So this is what church membership is. We're going to look at some biblical texts to help you understand this. I'm going to give you a couple of quotes. Here are three books that I found pretty helpful. Um, there's a short one by Lehman, Church Membership. Christians don't join churches, they submit to them. I thought that was a, a helpful idea. Uh, I can't say Tabidi on your Bile's name very well, but the second book's by him. To fail to associate ourselves in a lasting, committed way with the head of the church by joining his body is surely a sign of ingratitude. Is that right? Uh, if, if, a, if a young man or young woman's refusing to associate in a formal way, it's ingratitude, whether a form of uninformed or a dull heart. And then... Last book that's helpful is my friend, Dr. Jeremy Kimball, 40 Questions About Church Membership and Discipline. Okay, so is church membership biblical? Here's a couple statements, and then I'm going to give you a biblical defense. Uh, the modern practice of church membership, though nowhere explicitly commanded in the New Testament, best achieves the commitment identification with himself that God intends for his people. Okay. And I think that's a good way to put it. Like, is there a passage that says formally uh, that you must become a church member? Uh, no, I just don't know how you're going to live out the commands about the church if that is not your practice. Okay, so I think church membership is the way to live out those practices that are explicitly commanded. Okay, let me give you four Categories. So I'm going to talk about four things here. Uh, when we think about church membership, the question we get asked is, is church membership biblical? And here's going to be my four categories. I'm going to talk about images for the church, the structure of the church, practices of the church, and the care of the church. Okay? So if like you're thinking about your notes, here are the four main points. We're going to have some texts and explanation for each of those main points. Images, structure, practices, care. Images for the church. I'm going to show you some images and I want you to think about this question. What do these images have in common? So, you know, we don't have a text that says this is the church. The church is these, these, these things. But we have a number of images or pictures of the church. Let me give any, any ideas. So, one of the pictures is body, I mentioned. What's another picture of the church? Another one? Yeah. Bride, good. Other ones? Vine and branches. Uh, yeah, they're, that's an image, good. Yep. So here are some that Paul mentions. Body, household, field, building, temple, flock. What do these particular images have in common? Yeah. They can, they can grow. Yeah, that's true. They can grow. Uh, they, they can grow. Other things. Yeah. They're physical. Yep. Yeah, they're, they're pictures of things. Good. Yeah. Okay. They do need to be maintained. That is true. They take care. There's another thing that's true about them. What is a flock comprised of? Sheep, yeah, sheep, right? Multiple sheep. What's a temple comprised of? Multiple blocks or bricks. You think of a field has multiple uh, plants as a part of it. Or a household has multiple members. Or you are one body with many parts, right? So each of them are collective wholes. 
The emphasis is on the whole, not the individual part. Notice also that there are implicit boundaries. So, it's very clear where my body ends, right? Like, it's the end of my body right there. It's clear who are members of a household. Now, one of the ways that we do that in, in our context is we have the same last name, right? Those are the members of my household. To mark a field, they put up boundary markers, right? So there are limits to this entity. A, a building or a temple has boundaries. And so there's a flock, a shepherd needs a way to mark his flock off. Any of you come from like a farming community? Not real. Okay, so most of you not from a farming community. Do you know how uh, you know farmers mark their cattle, their sheep, or their pigs? What do they do? Yeah, an ear tag. We don't do that with church membership. We don't do. Uh, but uh, the idea is that there is some way to mark off that flock from another flock. So even in the images of the church there are identifiable boundaries. It's, this is my flock. That's your flock. So in that text we read in 1 Peter, do you remember what the text said? Shepherd the flock of God that is among you. There's a particular flock in this context that is there. So there is some shepherding function for this particular flock distinct from that flock. There are individual churches. It's not a, just a universal church. There are local entities with implicit boundaries, even as we've seen with these images. So when we start with the images, we have collective holes with boundaries. Now, are there boundaries just for the sake of boundaries? No, actually, the boundaries function for the care of the church and for the structure of the church. So how is a church to be structured? Well, the Bible calls us to accountable relationships, specifically with, with leaders and with one another. And church membership makes explicit those relationships. So, the structure of the church accountability to leaders. Christians are commanded to be obedient to and supportive of the leaders who are over them. This suggests a particular church and its leaders. So like, let me just read. I'll just choose one of these. Let me read Hebrews 13, 17. 13, 17. Obey your leaders and submit to them, for they are keeping watch over your souls as those who will give an account. Okay, so here's my question for each of you. This is, this is an unambiguous command. Obey your leaders and submit to them. Who are your leaders? Who are they? Are you submitting to them? These are the ones that are charged with keeping watch over your souls. And they're going to give an account so the person that says, oh, I don't want to join a church, I just don't know how you're going to obey that command. Like, I don't know how you're going to be obedient to that if you're not willing to commit to a particular group and its leaders. And I just want to say, the people at Cedarville University are not your leaders in this sense. We realize this is talking about the local church. So, you know, Dr. White, the president, he doesn't say that this is his to fulfill because he recognizes this is a local church. You just heard from Dr. Wood. If we had the dean of the Bible department in here, he'd say the same thing to you. He'd say, this is not to, this is not our context, this is not the, the context of uh, Cedarville University. This is a local church. That was supposed to be funny because I'm the dean of the Bible department, but nobody laughed. Okay. So accountability to leaders. Accountability of leaders for members. Well, we just read, they're keeping watch over your souls. Like, 
your, your local church pastors, pastor elders are keeping watch over your souls and they're going to give an account. They're going to give an account. Think about that. Think about this, the, the disservice that someone would do to a leader if they were assuming that that person is shepherding my soul, but they've never made that explicit. So the leader is going to have to give an account for those uh, that he's shepherding. Well, at least do him the kindness of telling them that he's shepherding your soul. Or think about what we read earlier in 1 Peter 5. Exhort the elders among you as a fellow elder to shepherd the flock of God that is among you, exercising oversight, not under compulsion, but willingly as God would have you. If I'm going to shepherd the flock that's been entrusted to me, I need to know who that flock is. Think about me operating in Cedarville. So when I walk down the sidewalk, there are all, a lot of Christians, and I have affection for each one of those Christians but I have a particular committed affection and oversight for those who are members of my local church. There's a distinction in our relationships. I'm, I'm not in every way responsible for every Christian that walks around campus, but there are some to whom I have committed as a church member and to whom I have committed as a church pastor elder. The structure of the church. Well, it's not just the idea of there are definable boundaries, the boundaries aren't the end in themselves, the structure of the church isn't the end in itself, but it's those things make possible the practices of the church. Okay. Baptism. Okay. So, think about this. Who in here has been baptized? Okay. Who in here baptized themselves? Oh, that's good. I'm glad, I'm glad to see that. <laughs> um, so uh, just for the record, no hands were raised on self-baptism. Uh, because baptism requires someone else baptizing you, right? This is a practice of another person that's immersing a believer into water. So in the immersion of a believer into water, there's also an incorporation of that believer into the church. When Paul in Ephesians 4 talks about what unites them as a church, one of the things is that shared baptism. So you know, there's an idea of uh, immersion and incorporation that's tied up with the practice of baptism. The Lord's Supper. What do we do around the Lord's table? We think about Paul in 1 Corinthians uh, uh, 10, where he describes when we gather to take the Lord's Supper, we have fellowship with Christ Himself and fellowship with one another. There's something beautiful and powerful about that meal. What other term do we sometimes use for the Lord's Supper? Communion. Communion. Eucharist is a, is a term that, that, that speaks to the gift or the blessing that it is. But communion. It's a community. Church discipline. Now we don't have time to go into this at length. But part of what this idea of membership does is it enables you to live out a practice of church discipline. How are you going to live out church discipline if you don't have a definable unit? So, 1 Corinthians 5, you have an issue of a brother in sexual immorality. And Paul is pretty angry that the church tolerates it. And he says, cast out the immoral person from among you. That sounds harsh in our context. Cast him out? Well, why? Well for the good of his own soul, so that he would be led to repentance, for the purity of the church, for the warning of other believers, for the testimony of the church, so that we might publicly say that this is not how Christians live. There's a lot of reasons for discipline. But let's just say that practice is made possible by having a definable whole. If you just have an amorphous group of people who gather, 
How can you cast that person out? But if you said, we are committing together. We're going to make the gospel visible in this particular place. We're going to commit to one another, to disciple one another, to walk alongside one another, to oversee and be overseen together then it makes sense when someone breaks from that commitment to say that you're not a part of this anymore and we plead with them to repent and return. That's what's happening in in 1 Corinthians 5. How are you going to do that if you don't have membership? Don't neglect meeting together. With whom do you meet? Do you just float around to a different meeting of Christians every Sunday morning? I just want to exhort you for the good of your soul, for the good of the testimony of the church. Don't go to a bunch of different churches. Settle on one. I realize when you come here as freshmen, you're going to take some time to find a church. Don't let that practice extend. Don't say, you know, I'm going to go with my friend to this church and then next week I'm going to go... No, you need to be settled. You need to be planted for the good of your soul. The practices of the church. Well, another thing we want to talk about is the care of the church. Okay, let me pause. I've said a lot so far. Uh, what que- is there a question here or should we wait for questions at the end when I get to the fourth point? Got a question? Yeah. How would you go about um, um, like kicking someone out of the church? Okay. Um, <laughs> so the question is, how would you go about kicking someone out of the church? I would use different terminology. Uh, we might say disfellowship someone uh, for the sake of their soul. Uh, so there's a process. Matthew 18 lines outlines this, right? So it talks about if there's a, a brother sins against you, what do you do? So there's, there's, there are steps. You don't just go like, you sinned against me, you're out. Um, so uh, the whole goal is restoration and repentance. So you're, you're seeking a brother or sister that they would repent for the good of the soul and be restored to fellowship. That's, that's the goal from the, from the very beginning. So first you go to that person personally. Person, let's say that person re- repents and the fellowship is restored. They reject that. Let's say they reject it. Well, you go with it two or three and you say, this is the issue, brother, let's repent. And if that still isn't effective, you bring the church. And that might be the representatives of the church first, like the elders and the pastor elders. And if that's not effective, you tell it to the church. And you have the church plead with this person. This is not in keeping with your profession of faith in Christ. You're not evidencing new life. And you plead with that person. And if they persist in their hardness of heart and rebellion, a grace from God to help wake them up to the folly of their sin is to say, formally, we can't affirm your profession of faith anymore. Because the way you're living is not in step with the confession that you're making. So for the good of your soul, we're going to remove you from the membership or the fellowship of the church. Seeking your repentance and longing for your restoration. For the good of the purity of the church, we're doing this. Paul says that you're you're supposed to be a new lump. You're not supposed to have the old leaven in your church so that other believers are warned, so that our hearts are chastened to forsake sin for the good of our testimony as well, so that when non-believers look on, they're not scandalized by immorality in the church. Paul talks about this in 1 Corinthians 5. He says, And such a thing is not even named among the Gentiles. Like Even non-believers know that that's terrible behavior. And here it's tolerated and even celebrated in your church. Does that make sense? Good questions. Other questions? Yeah. How do you think it would be um, uh, a good idea to be a 
church membership. Like you said before, how in your church, it's not, it's not your church is going to be perfect. There's going to be problems you're going to have to go through. But what do you think would be uh, necessary or a good idea for someone to break up? Yeah, so when should you break fellowship with a church? Um, so I'll be a little brief because we're trying to get you in fellowship with a church right now. That's what I'm trying to make. Um, your questions are when to, when to, how to get someone out and when to leave yourself, which are good questions. Um, uh, but uh, so I think uh, I am not hasty in making a church transition. I'm going to labor for a group, of, for a church to which I've committed. Um, I'm, I'm not going to leave over personal preferences. I'm not going to leave over personal disagreements. I'm not going to leave over inconveniences. Um, but there are natural times to transition. If, if your job, let's you want to be in the military, uh, if you get transferred uh, posts, you have no choice. You have to go. Um, and let's say you're a, a member of a church at Cedarville and you get stationed in Okinawa, Japan. You should join a church over there, right? Um, so if you have to move for some reason, I think there's a legitimacy. That's a positive thing. There's another positive thing. Let's say the church sends you out. Say the church sends you out to start another church or revitalize a church. Well, that's when you transition your membership. Let's say the church commissions you to be a missionary. There's another time to transfer membership. Those are some positive things. I think your question was probably like, when do I regrettably have to leave a church. Um, I think when a church um, has an incompatibility of doctrine and practice with what you hold convictionally. So, with a brief side note, sometimes we talk about this concept of what we call theological triage. So there are first order issues, let's say like essentials of the faith. These are things that if you don't believe, you're not a Christian. So like the deity of Christ, the substitutionary atonement of Christ. You don't believe those, you're not a Christian. Then there are secondary things. and some, Sometimes people call those convictions. Sometimes uh, you know, they have different terms for them. But let's just use the term secondary theological beliefs. Uh, those are reasons that I might have different fellowship with, with people. So like um, I have Presbyterian friends, very dear Presbyterian friends, um, who are certainly Christians. They believe essentials of the faith. But we have differences in practice and ecclesiology that are significant that we're not going to operate in the same church as well. And he's going to joke with me, and I'm going to joke with him, and um, he's going to go his way, and I'm going to go God's way. Um, so <laughs> um, but then there, are, then there are level, if we're going to have a third level, there are areas of preference, right? So what are some things, of, and I'm not going to leave over preference, so preference, my categorization of preference might be church dress. Is it more formal or less formal? Bible translation, so long as it's legitimate. Like if it's, if it's a bad translation, I, I can't sit under that preached so-called word. Um, so uh, music style is going to be another one. Maybe ministry preferences. Do we do Sunday school or small group or do we have an institute? Those are matters in ministry practice that I'm not going to leave a church over. But if it's a you know, second or first order doctrinal issue that changes, I'm probably going to leave. I could leave over that. I think if there is, there is fundamental uh, unhealth in a church in which they are not willing to fulfill the Great Commission, I think that could be an issue as well. So if there's no vision for ministry. Okay, care of the church. I want to make sure I, I get to this. One another commands. Love one another. Be devoted to one another. Support one another. Care for one another. With whom will you live out the one another commands? With whom are you obligating yourself to do these things? When it says encourage one another, you realize that's not a suggestion. With whom have you obligated yourself to encourage them? Care for the poor. Christians generally care for the poor, but it's also to be concentrated upon caring for those in the church. We see this in Acts 6, where they're 
caring for the widows. We see this in 1 Timothy 5, let a widow be enrolled, and then there's a description of who meets the qualification for being on the church widow roll. Oh, wait, wait a second there. Signing on the dotted line is not a biblical practice, they say. Let a widow be enrolled. Does that mean there's a list? So the church in 1 Timothy 5, 9, I think it is, the church seemingly has a, a list. Why do they have a list? So they know for whom they're obligated to care. So all of these things are connected. The image of the church of this collective whole with the emphasis on unity but also boundary. It serves to undergird the structure of the church with church leadership and church members, which then feeds into the practices of the church, like the ordinances we looked at, and things like church discipline. And it enables then the care of the church. Things like the one another commands are caring for the physical needs of the church. You see how those things fit together. And if you're going to live out all of those realities, I think in our context it's going to be formally committing to a local church. So, there's some hapless freshmen that ask you, do you think I should join a local church? And let's just assume the reason, the answer is yes. Uh, for the sake of class, tell me why. Why should they join a local church? Should I just go down the line or do you guys want to just offer up things voluntarily? Voluntarily? Why should we, what would you tell that freshman why they should join the church? Yeah. Yeah, it's a, it's a way to live out the biblical commands. Yeah. To fellowship formally with other Christians. We're met for community. Other reasons. Yeah. If you're not willing to commit to a church, is your um, so called commitment real? Yeah. It is, yeah. Is your so called commitment real if you're not willing to formalize that? Yeah. It provides a foundation for, like, your personal walk. That's right. Yeah, that corporate reality helps to sustain my personal devotion. Yeah, Bradley. Yeah. It's a discipline of grace from God. Good, Jane. Oh, isn't there something special about corporate worship? That's what we're going to look at next class period. Yeah. Anything else stand out? I think another thing is my soul needs discipleship. It needs formative discipleship and it needs corrective discipleship, sometimes called discipline. Hebrews 3, take care lest there be in any of you an evil and unbelieving heart. You ever realize you got to take care of that? What's the antidote to that? But exhort one another as long as it is called today. It doesn't say exhort yourself. That suggests I have relationships in which people will exhort me. Why do students need the church? Now, I'm specific here. I'm not just talking about, you know, middle-aged folk. I'm talking about students. Why do you need the church? For the good of your souls today. I want you to be obedient to the commands Jesus has given you. I want you to fall into the model of New Testament Christians. I want you to experience some of these promises that are to the church. Remember the, when Jesus says that the gates of hell will not prevail against the church? That's like there's the gates of hell and the church is storming it with the gospel message. How ridiculous would it be for you to storm the gates of hell by yourself? Storm the gates of hell with your church. It reflects the diversity and universality of the gospel call. I want 
and for the good of your souls tomorrow. I want you to establish in college patterns of faithfulness that will sustain you in your Christian life. You do realize that you don't get Bible in the gospel class. You don't get the Bible minor every year for the rest of your life. Oh, you can because we're recording it, right? <laughs> but uh, uh, you don't have chapel every day. You're probably going to work in a non-Christian environment. You're going to have the church, though. Establishing patterns of faithfulness for the rest of your life. Preparing a home for which your family can flourish spiritually. Imagine what my home would be like if I told my kids, ah, we're, we're done with church. We're going to do some things here, but we're not going to gather as a church. Think of the spiritual benefit from which I would be robbing them. My kids, they, I, hope that, I hope they respect me. I hope they respect my wife, but they need other examples of faithfulness. They need to see other men and women walking. They need godly friendships. If you're going to raise a family in the faith, the church is essential. For the love of your church leaders, let them know for whom they're accountable. Don't do them a disservice by having an ambiguous relationship with a church. Do it for the love of other church members. Tell them, I am committed to loving you. Do it for the testimony of the world. Isn't there something beautiful when Christians gather together and say, you're a lot different than me? There could be funny differences. I like Ohio State football. They like Michigan football. There could be more fundamental differences. There could be differences of ethnicity. There could be differences of upbringing. There could be differences of nationality. But what binds us together is our shared confession of Jesus Christ. Our shared desire to have a gospel witness in this local place. There's something beautiful about that. When our preferences are lesser than the blood of Christ. When our personal dispositions are lesser than the blood of Christ. We say that there's something truly supernatural that gathers us together. One last illustration, and then I know you want to go to lunch. Can I be a Christian without the church? Well, the answer is yes. But it would be like driving at night without the headlights. That's not how the manufacturer designed it. <laughs> it's unwise. It's dangerous, and it's a hazard to those who are, who are around you. I'd hate for you to lead others into a non-committed relationship with a local church. Let's just imagine this. Let's imagine that everybody in your generation, everybody in your generation chose not to commit to a local church. Where would the church be? If worldwide nobody would commit in your generation to a local church, imagine the detriment that would be done. 